While it's been around for a long time in various forms, the genre of alternate history really took off in the early 90s, due in large part to the extremely prolific Harry Turtledove. Part of what I find interesting about it is how it acts as a mirror to historical determinism. The idea that because of factors A, B, and C, outcome X was inevitable. Culturally, we can indulge in entertainment like The Man in the High Castle, for example, while being secure in the knowledge that there's no way that the Axis could have won. Axis wins is almost its own genre at this point. But two of my favorite World War mutations involve new players. S.M. Sterling's Draca books, obviously, and Harry Turtledove's World War series. Together, they help to illustrate a broader point about war and the study of history. In Sterling's books, the Draca, America's evil twin, enter the war on the Allied side and end up enslaving all of Europe. Turtledove gives us a race of arrogant little lizard men from space with the bad luck of showing up to conquer the Earth in 1942. In both cases, there is a technological disparity. Though in the case of the Draca, it tends to be greatly exaggerated and is really just a case of recognizing potential. In very rough terms, the Draca enter the war in 1942 with what we think of as late 1940s small arms and late 40s, maybe early 50s tanks. The Lizards enter with what we could roughly compare to 1990s equivalent vehicles, including jet aircraft, helicopter gunships, and, and third generation tanks roughly comparable to like the A1 model of the Abrams or the Leopard 2, but we'll come back to that in a bit. Both are able to engage and defeat numerically superior forces, which gives them an operational edge at the beginning of the war. But it comes with costs, not least of which is the time and expense that goes into replacing losses. But unlike for the Draca, attrition is only part of the lizard's problem. Their culture is extremely conservative, and this carries over into their technology and tactics. Because their technological development is so slow, methodical, and deliberate, it's somewhat misleading to compare it to our own tech. While Lizard tanks and aircraft are comparable from a performance standpoint to 1990s equivalent equipment, what we know of their society suggests that they're incremental improvements on earlier designs. For example, say that the Lizards decide they want a bigger gun on their tanks. Well, they'll start by designing this larger gun up to the specifications that they require. They'll do extensive studies on the design, refining it, refining it, before they finally build a prototype. They will test that extensively, and then they will start making changes to the Land Cruiser design to accommodate the bigger gun as needed, and only as needed. They won't design a completely new tank. Consequently, the Lizard Land Cruiser is probably less like an Abrams and more like a maxed out Sherman with a hydrogen engine, composite armor, and a larger gun. Now, so the tendency will be towards a lot of very robust systems, a lot of legacy hardware, and consequently the Lizard Land Cruisers in 1942 probably have a very high level of parts commonality with the Land Cruisers that they used in their previous planetary conquest thousands of years prior. Having such compartmentalized and refined designs means that on the one hand their equipment is extremely reliable and very robust, but it also potentially makes it much easier to reverse engineer them piecemeal and port over some of the technologies that you can glean from that while working around the, the things that you can't duplicate with 1940s technology, the uh, solid state electronics for example. It could also result in the lizard machines having a bit of a retro future look to our eyes. Both the lizards and the Draca have a small population compared to their adversaries. While we don't have precise numbers for how many lizards are in the invasion fleet, we do know that the number is absolutely finite. They're not getting reinforcements, and on account of their army being all male, they aren't making any more. The same holds for their equipment. From landing craft to ammunition, their replenishment rate is essentially zero. We have set down our factory ships. As we gain raw materials, we shall be able to increase our stocks. As you say, exalted fleet lord, Carol answered. He did not say, presumably because he knew Atvar knew it as well as himself, that the factories, even at top output, could not produce in a day more than a small part of the supplies the race's armed forces used during that day. They eventually managed to make some ammunition and spare parts locally, but they can't replace guided munitions or vehicles. 
The Draca are less extreme. With a citizen population of less than 37 million people in 1942, they are not a numerous people compared to Germany, for example, at a bit over 86 million. Of course, this includes children, women, and the elderly, as well as fighting age men. And Draca women serve in combat units, so their potential numbers are essentially doubled. But this still leaves them with a significantly outnumbered force, considering they are fighting across a wide front stretching from Russia to Western Europe. The Draca also have about half a billion serfs, but only a tiny percentage of them are capable and trusted to bear arms as janissaries, and even they require citizen officers, which have to come at the expense of the regular citizen army. The serfs that do all the work in the Draca economy also require a significant security presence. Draca society is well equipped for quick land grabs and long, low intensity pacification ops. They are not well suited for a long, sustained, high intensity total war. Draca industry is a bit peculiar as well. In some ways, their slave based economy is easier to shift to a total war footing. But because it is a slave economy, it has no need for either mass produced consumer goods or labor saving machinery. Consequently, the Draca don't have the equivalent of the American automotive industry or massive state owned Soviet tractor factories that can be quickly converted to wartime production. The Draca are forced to focus on quality over quantity, both in terms of the personnel in their citizen army and the equipment that they give them. But quantity has a quality all its own that can be difficult to overcome. Still, the Draca do have functioning industry. The lizards are a purely expeditionary force. Every shell, cartridge, or missile they fire today is one less they have available tomorrow. The material situation alone dictates the core of how to defeat these adversaries. To defeat the Draca, you have to inflict pain on them in the field by focusing mass force at their citizen formations. It doesn't require defeating them in a decisive battle, only to make them bleed until they just don't have the blood to spare. The lizards can't replace soldiers or munitions. All you have to do is not lose. They get weaker every day the fighting continues. Harass them, kill them when you can, but always keep them shooting at you and watch their capability degrade. Both are greatly overextended. Both know it. But neither consider quitting. Why? The Draca, like the Nazis, consider themselves to be a master race. But where the Nazis meant superior, the Draca literally mean master. They see themselves as having a destiny to enslave all of mankind. This belief feeds their brutality and conquest, and their successes reinforce the belief. The lizards, too, have a cultural mindset of inherent superiority. Their civilization goes back tens of thousands of years in an unbroken line of steady and methodical advancement. In the ancient past, they unified their world under a single emperor. They haven't fought a serious opponent in 50,000 years. The Draca have a social structure that requires expansion. The second sons of Draca families need new land for new estates, and their slave economy locks them into low-skill labor models. They have limited avenues to increase efficiency, so they have to increase capacity. Without expansion, Draca society can't survive as it is. It's always on a knife edge, needing force and expansion to hold it up. The lizards are models of stability. They have no apparent need for another world, and Earth is too cold and wet for them anyway. As far as we can tell, they want to conquer our world because it's been a few thousand years and it's time to expand the empire again. It's cultural, almost ritualistic. When the lizards arrive at Earth, they come with a mindset of absolute confidence and superiority that is born out of having a unified spacefaring civilization for longer than we've had written language and previously conquering two other worlds that were so primitive it was like playing on god mode. Both the lizards and the Draca enter the war with an expectation of victory. The difference is that while the lizards plan is based on information that's 800 years out of date, the Draca can be brutally honest in their assessment because they have been able to watch their enemies fighting each other for several years before they decide to enter. The Draca plan for the real conditions of the war in a brutally pragmatic way and they don't let their mythos of conquest transform into a determinist myth. As Archstrategos Karl von Schreckenberg explains, Where are the children of the men who before 1914 calmly sat to debate how enlightenment and reform would be forced on the primitive Draca? How they could bring us democracy? 
In graves from here to China, working in our fields and kitchens, laboring in mines and factories to build our power. Doesn't this seem like the unfolding of destiny, the sacred destiny of the race? Horseshit. We won because we were tough and prepared, because we were lucky enough to have enemies who fight each other rather than us. While the Draken knew that they needed their enemies to fight each other, the Lizards unintentionally united all of Earth in an alliance against them. The Draka, knowing they lack the manpower and industrial capacity to defeat a united Europe, instead form alliances that allow them to use other nations to serve their own ends. Russian manpower and American industry do the heavy lifting against Germany, and that is when the Draka push into the heart of Europe and occupy key positions that allow them to leverage control over the rest. The Draka leverage their higher quality but greatly outnumbered army into a conquering force and end up seizing a continent. The Lizards fail to leverage their initial overwhelming technological superiority and consequently they have to negotiate a peace that leaves them with only part of the world they came to conquer. The Lizards had vast experience guiding their thinking. Nothing in their own history or that of the previous worlds they'd conquered gave them any reason to consider the possibility that Earth's inhabitants might advance at a much faster rate. On the contrary, they had three independent examples that reinforced the idea that technological advancement is extremely slow and extremely methodical and very predictable. That's important to keep in mind. They weren't reckless. They weren't stupid. They were just wrong. On the other hand, we shouldn't be too smug with our own cleverness either. Because the fact is, if the lizards had invaded in 800 BC, 800 AD, or even 1800, they would have stomped humanity with very little effort. It's just that the technological advancement in the 20th century particularly was just bizarre. The lizards, on the other hand, drew entirely wrong conclusions from the data that they had available. It would be like seeing a picture of a snow-covered mountain, mistaking it for sand and preparing for a desert expedition. That said, both Fleet Lord Atvar and Adolf Hitler faced essentially the same problem of having bitten off more than they could chew and having no choice but to chew harder or choke on it. The Draka have a different set of unknowns. They are aware of the military strengths of their opponents because they've been able to watch them fight for years. What the Draka can't be sure of is how the Allies will respond when they're entering into the war. The entire Draka strategy is premised on the assumption that that Europe will not unite behind Nazi Germany and that the United States will not ally with a Nazi-dominated Europe against the Draco. If Europe had collectively weighed their real options and decided they'd rather be fascist than slaves, the Draco strategy would have been untenable. If the United States had decided that the Nazis are both less odious and less dangerous in the long term than the Draco, the American-European alliance would not only have effectively doomed any chance of a Draco victory in Europe, but also, by killing large numbers of young citizens in combat, endangered the continued existence of the domination unless they immediately withdrew to their own borders. The Draco bet on the short-sightedness of their opponents. They guessed right, but they still guessed. So how is this relevant in our world? The Sukomlinov effect is the observation that in a military conflict, the side with the fanciest uniforms will lose. While it sounds rather fanciful, it turns out to be remarkably accurate. However, it does not follow that an army can win a war simply by abolishing epaulets and big hats. By the same token, Germany didn't lose the war just because America could pack Liberty ships full of Sherman tanks and Russia has bad winners. It was a combination of allied strengths and German weaknesses mixed in a stew of randomness and unintended consequences. We can look back at these and say, these are the reasons the Allies won, but it only works looking backwards. For example, in June of 1941, Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union and Hitler moved to the newly constructed Eastern Front headquarters in what is now Poland. It was built in a damp, mosquito-infested patch of forest, uh, maybe because somebody thought it would conceal it from aerial observation, um, maybe just because some German bean counters bought the cheapest land they could find. From this headquarters, Hitler directed the broad strategic moves of the war against Russia. But there was some disagreement over what that strategy should be. Hitler's generals, the sharply dressed conservative aristocrats that they were, 
wanted to seize Moscow, take the enemy's capital as a prize and force a surrender. A very 19th century European way of doing these things. Hitler, the corporal from the trenches, thought that was rubbish. Whether out of genius or amateurism is open for debate. His plan focused on seizing Crimea, Donetsk, and the Caucasus oil fields, and Moscow can just go bugger itself. This would deprive the Red Army of oil and coal, crippling their ability to fight against a mechanized army. At this point in time, Germany had the momentum, and the Red Army was kind of a disorganized mess for a multitude of reasons, some of them being Stalin. With a little luck, Hitler's plan could have worked. In fact, the Soviet general staff recognized it as their worst case scenario. But living in a freshly built concrete bunker in a swamp is not a healthy environment for an old man. In August, Hitler got rather ill. Bedridden and tended to by his doctor, he was unable to harangue and micromanage his generals on a daily basis, as was his custom. During this time, the objective drifted from the strategic oil and coal sources to Moscow. By the time the generals had shifted the focus and Hitler had recovered enough to rebuke them, Germany had lost momentum for either objective and the Red Army had sorted itself into a more formidable force than it had been a few months before. The onset of winter snuffed out the last of the momentum, and Germany was stuck in exactly the kind of war it was ill-suited to fight. Might it have gone differently if the wolf's lair had been built on more desirable real estate? We might now have a subgenre of alternate history where the Allies win. Stories that people find amusing, but everyone knows that there was no way the high-quantity, low-quality, allied, factory-driven war could have won against superior strategic thinking and higher-quality German forces. There will be copious volumes by historians written to elaborate why this was, showing all the reasons why the Allies lost, all of their shortcomings stacked up against the Axis strengths, on and on, until we reach this point where the outcome appears inevitable. As the Draken knew and the Lizards learned, good stats and confidence aren't enough to win wars, and destiny is an illusion of hindsight. Every time I say defeat them in a decisive battle, there's a ball of eagle out here somewhere. The cause. It's the most America thing I've experienced all day.